Jonna, has it never occurred to you that the mark upon your cheek might be removed? No, indeed. To tell you the truth, it has been so often called a charm that I was simple enough to believe it might be so. Ah, uh, perhaps upon another face, but never on yours. No, dearest Georgiana, you came so nearly perfect from the hand of nature that this possible defect, which we hesitate whether to term defect or beauty, shocks me as being the visible mark of earthly imperfection. Shocks you, my husband? Then why did you take me from my mother's side? You cannot love what shocks you. <laughs> Do you remember? My dear Alma, do you have any recollection of a dream last night about this odious hand? None. None whatever. I might well dream of it. For before I fell asleep, it had taken a pretty firm hold of my fancy. And did you dream of it? Terrible dream. I wonder that you can forget it. Is it possible to forget this one expression? It is in her heart now. We must have it out. Reflect, my husband. For by all means, I would have you recall that dream. It has reached her heart now. We must get it out. Aloma, I know not what may be the cost to both of us to rid me of this fatal birthmark. Perhaps its removal may cause curious deformity. Or it may be this stain goes as far as deep as life itself. Again, do we know that there is a possibility on any terms of unclasping the firm grip of this little hand which was laid upon me before I came into the world? Dearest Georgiana, I have spent much thought upon the subject. I am convinced of the perfect practicability of its removal. There be the remotest possibility of it, let the attempt be made at whatever risk. Danger is nothing to me. While this hateful mark makes me the object of your horror and disgust, life is a burden, which I would fling down with joy. Either remove this dreadful hand, or take my wretched life. You have deep science. All the world bears witness of it. You have achieved great wonders. Cannot you remove this little, little mark? which I cover with the tips of my two small fingers. Is it beyond your power for the sake of your own peace and to save your poor wife from madness? Noblest, dearest, tenderest wife, doubt not my power. I've already given this matter the deepest thought, thought which might almost have enlightened me to create a being less perfect than yourself. Georgiana, you have led me deeper than ever into the heart of science. I feel myself fully competent to render this dear cheek as faultless as its fellow. And then, most beloved, what will be my triumph when I shall have corrected what nature left imperfect and ate her fairest work? Even Pygmalion, when his sculptured woman assumed light, felt no greater ecstasy than what mine will be. It is resolved then, and Aloma, spare me not, though you should find the birthmark take refuge in my heart at last. Throw open the door, Aminadab! Yes, master. If she were my wife, I'd never part with that birthmark. Where am I? Oh, I remember. Fear not, my dearest. Do not shrink from me. Believe me, Georgiana. I even rejoice in this single imperfection. It will be such a rapture to remove it. Oh, spare me. Please do not look at it again. It's magical. I dare not touch it. Pluck it and inhale its brief perfume while you may. The flower will wither in a few moments and leave nothing save its brown seed vessels that thence may be perpetuated a race as ephemeral as itself.
The concoction of the draught has been perfect. Unless all my science have deceived me, it cannot fail. Save on your account, my dearest Alma. I might wish to put off this birthmark of mortality by relinquishing mortality itself in preference to any other mode. Life is but a sad possession to those who have attained precisely the degree of moral advancement to which I stand. Were I weaker and blinder, it might be happiness. Were I stronger, it might be endured hopefully. But being what I find myself, methinks, I am of all mortals the most fit to die. You are fit for heaven without tasting death. But why do we speak of dying? The draught cannot fail. Behold its effect upon this plant. There needed no proof. Give me the goblet. I joyfully stake all upon your word. Drink then, thou lofty creature. There is no taint of imperfection on thy spirit. Thy sensible frame too. Thou shall soon be perfect. It is grateful. Methinks it is like water from a heavenly fountain. For it contains, I know not, what of unobstructive seventeen fragrance and deliciousness. It delays a feverish thirst that had parched me for many days. Now, dearest, let me sleep. My earthly senses are clothing over my spirit, like the leaves around the heart of a rose at sunset. By heaven, it is well nigh gone. I can scarcely trace it now. Success, success! And now it is like the faintest rose colour. The lightest flush of blood across her cheek would overcome it. But she is so pale. Ah, Claude, ah, earthly mass. You have served me well, matter and spirit, earth and heaven, have both eighteen done their part in this laugh thing of the senses. You have earned the right to laugh. My poor Eleanor. Poor? Nay, richest, happiest, most favoured. My peerless bride, it is successful. You are perfect. My poor Eleanor. You have aimed loftily, you have done nobly. Do not repent that with so high and pure a feeling you have rejected the best the earth could offer. Alamo, dearest Alamo, I am dying. Alas, it was too true. The fatal hand had grappled with the mystery of life and was the bond by which an angelic spirit kept itself in union with a mortal. As the last crimson tint of the birthmark, that sole token of human imperfection faded from her cheek, the parting breath of the now perfect woman passed into the atmosphere, and her soul, lingering a moment near her husband, took its heavenward flight. Then a hearse chuckling laugh was heard again. Thus ever does the gross fatality of uh, earth exult in its invariable triumph of the, over the immortal essence, which in this dim sphere of half-development demands the completeness of a higher state. Yet, had Alamar reached a profounder wisdom, he need not thus have flung away the happiness which would have woven his mortal life of the self-same texture with the celestial. The momentary circumstance was too strong for him. He failed to look beyond the shadowy cope of time and living once for all eternity to find the perfect future in the present.